Okay, welcome to a little bit of an unusual video in our video series. In this video, I'm going to be talking about really nothing but results from the CFP exam, not the uh, old level one exam, but just the CFP exam uh, from November of 2019. And uh, those who know the results here will know why I'm talking about it. Those who don't, uh, maybe you want to stick around out of curiosity. Uh, this exam is, or this uh, video, sorry, is really for those who wrote and failed the exam, which is, of course, the uh, sort of unfortunate majority. Uh, so we're going to have a look at a few different things. But before we do, I have the standard disclaimer. And of course, this is Jason Watt from uh, Business Career College. Thanks so much for joining us. So of course, the whole CFP uh, and all the associated stuff with that is uh, trademarked and owned and controlled in Canada by FP Canada and globally by the Financial Planning Standards Board. Uh, the exam itself is administered by FP Canada Standards Council. And I don't want to give any sort of uh, wrong impression here. Uh, the stuff I'm talking about here is all based on, uh, we'll say, my speculation or access to publicly available information. I'm not presenting anything in here that's based on some sort of inside knowledge or whatever the case is. I just have the benefit of having uh, paid attention to this exam for about a dozen years now. And uh, there is going to be some speculation here. Uh, not everything about the exam is publicly available. Uh, so that's my responsibility. I don't blame FP Canada for whatever speculation you see. Okay, here's what we're gonna look at look at uh, this result and we'll compare that with some past results. We're going to talk about what repeat writers experience and some of what impacts them, uh, what went wrong on this particular version of the exam. Uh, we'll talk about the ethics cautionary notes, which I think are particularly telling here. Uh, and then exam feedback and preparing for a rewrite as well as a little bit of notes about exam technique for a possible rewrite. Okay, so this is the very uh, specific feedback that came from FP Canada to go along with this exam. Uh, basically, we had almost 1400 people write the exam and this included about 1,045, sorry, exactly 1,045 first time writers, and then 344 people who are reattempting. And we'll see the percentages broken down better on the next slide. But what I wanna show here is this last sentence. This is the one that we don't normally see in the feedback from FP Canada, uh, where it's this very specific comment about uh, exam results fluctuating. Clearly they were aware that they were going to get some questions about this and they have this comment here that says, look, we know this is lower than normal, although I know it's not exactly their wording uh, and maybe don't stress about that too much. Uh, so that's I think what they're shooting for with this comment. Okay, so here's where we see the, the difference is that on past attempts, we've normally seen for this exam around 62 to 66% of exam writers pass. Uh, this time, we had a significantly lower proportion than that, uh, about 44%. So uh, cut the proportion of passing exam writers roughly in half here. Uh, first time writers, uh, again, quite a bit higher results historically than we see on this iteration. And finally, repeat writers, and I think this was the, the most shocking of all these figures, that normally we see something less than half of repeat writers pass, and this time we have about one in six uh, repeat exam writers pass the exam. Real difficult for those repeat exam writers. Okay, so just a general comment. This is not unique to this exam. This is a pretty common thing. Of course, we have a lot of involvement with the uh, life license qualification exams as well. And you see much the same thing there, that people who are writing for the first time will have a higher 
a shot at passing, I guess. I don't know if that's the right way to look at it, but something like that, then those who are repeating. Why does this happen? Well, there are sort of three or two causes here, I guess, and one just comment. Uh, one is that people just tend to make the same mistakes. Uh, whatever caused your grief on the first exam, very difficult to correct that for a second exam. I really try to do my uh, exam prep to try and address some of that. So if you come to exam prep with me, I think it's common enough for people in the first two or three hours of exam prep to say, oh goodness, that's what I did wrong. I will be re uh, releasing later in the year here, once we have all our stats in, probably not until March, I'll be releasing in a blog post or in our newsletter article, I'm not sure where yet, uh, a comment about our exam results. I don't know what they're going to look like compared to national average just yet. It's too early to know. Uh, so then the next comment is you can only really expect about 40 to 60 points of improvement. And maybe this isn't how you feel, but this is my opinion here is that if you scored 400 the first time around, you should be happy with about a 450 or 460 the second time around. And then the third time around is when you should see that pass. Uh, not everybody does improve on a second right. I do see some people who uh, drop off on a second right, and that's that first comment. That's repeating the same errors. And then, of course, the neg negative experience. So I like this analogy around the car crash. So you, you were in an intersection, you had a car crash, and now first time since you drove uh, or since you had that car crash, you're driving back through that same intersection. Well, what happens here? People get nervous, they get a little worked up, they might have the sweats. And it's the same with the exam, that once you have that negative experience with it, really gets in people's heads and can cause a problem. So you can't guarantee success a second time around. All right, what went wrong this time? So there's lots of self-imposed pressure to pass. And that's especially true in this exam. This was the last attempt before our set of changes coming up with the PEP or IPE. And I don't want to comment on what your path ahead is, is here. Some people will have to do just IPE and then rewrite the exam. Uh, some of you may have to do PEP and rewrite. Uh, I will leave that to everybody's own circumstances. Uh, there is the addition of the degree requirement. So I know some people feel pressure because of that. Even though it's a couple of years out, it still creates some additional pressure. Um, and because just we had such a large number of exam writers, well, it really tells us that a lot more people uh, showed up ill-prepared. I did have larger number of people in our exam prep uh, than normal, and that also tells me something. But realistically, uh, just a lot more people going into the hopper means a lot more people showing up ill-prepared. And I would expect that it's a higher proportion of sort of ill-prepared exam writers than you would see in a normal iteration. I think FP Canada really pins most of the blame on that. Uh, and then finally, the ethics cautionary note. And we're going to go through this in some detail. I think there's some uh, fairly revealing information in this cautionary note. And I think a larger number of people than normal uh, failed the exam because of not respecting some uh, ethical or not recognizing maybe some ethical components to some of the questions. So this is the note. This is exactly what showed up in uh, exam writers exam feedback. This is actually, I guess, technically not publicly available, but it was mailed to uh, 1,389 people. And what we see here is, I think, more of a uh, sort of concerted effort than usual to flag these ethical issues. So where I normally see kind of some fairly generic language around this, uh, this time around we see several ethical issues. Usually there's two, sometimes I've seen three, but not to this level of detail, and a significant number of candidate responses. That really does tell us that you, um, that you may have had a challenge here. Now, I have a couple of comments about this. I know that the feedback or the, uh, the guide to examinations, I apologize, not the feedback, but the guide to examinations says this should show up in up to 6% of questions. However, 
uh, you can sure have it show up in more than that. It's a matter of kind of giving a candidate uh, rope and letting them hang themselves and the, using the proverb there. Uh, so 6% of questions are sort of designed this way. Okay? But that's not to say that more questions than that wouldn't have the opportunity for an ethical violation. Now, the other comment here is it just means you get that question wrong. So if you have an ethics violation, you get that question wrong. It's not like uh, running the stop sign on your driver's test where that means you fail the whole uh, exam or whatever the case is. It's just that you get that question wrong. Okay, so I hope that gives us a little bit of insight here, but Based on the number of comments, more than one question had an opportunity for an ethics violation in it. And my speculation here is it might have been more than 6% of the exam where there was that opportunity, even if the question wasn't designed that way. Okay, so the first we see here is a specific comment about suitability, making recommendations that are appropriate to the client. So the idea here, is that um, we're given a risk tolerance in the question somewhere and we just stick with that risk tolerance. Uh, I think sometimes people are tempted to go beyond the uh, risk tolerance suggested in the question for whatever reason. So when you see a risk tolerance presented, you just stick to it. And an example here, I'm not suggesting anybody actually did this. I have, I've seen this in exam prep for sure. Uh, but this is where you're given a risk tolerance, let's say 60-40, 60 60% uh, 60 equity, 40% fixed income, uh, but the client is not going to meet their objectives at that rate of return, and you have a SEG fund that's, a, let's say, a 75-25 mix, and an advisor says, well, really, the SEG fund has guarantees, and therefore, I can put them in that 75-25 mix because it's a SEG fund. No, that's not true. You'd still be using a 60-40 mix. And in class, I talk a fair bit about the uh, value of those guarantees and where they help and where they don't help. And this is a case where they don't help. They don't let you take on more risk than what the uh, risk tolerance uh, normally suggests. Uh, that's one that I've, one example of something that could go wrong here. This might apply to using leverage where there's no indication that leverage is appropriate. Uh, we could have lots of attempts to sort of violate the client's risk tolerance based on all kinds of poorly, um, poorly established assumptions, let's say. Okay, uh, then joint engagements. And this is an area where there's lots of potential opportunity for a mess here. Uh, so my concern here is you have a joint engagement. This would be, of course, almost exclusive to couples. And so clearly there was some case on the exam that would have dealt with a couple. And in that scenario, when you have one party in the couple who wants one thing and the other party wants something else, this can be challenging. Uh, you don't take instructions from somebody who's not the actual owner of the account or doesn't have legal control over the account. So power of attorney is okay here. Uh, but really, when you have that couple that disagrees, and I'm not sure that that's what happened in this particular scenario, but we can read a fair bit into the ethics note here. Uh, so let's say they have a difference of opinion. One of them wants to build an RESP for the kid and the other doesn't. Uh, that's where we may have a conflict of interest. And the FP Canada standards are very clear on this, that in that conflict of interest situation, the client doesn't uh, get any more advice or engagement on that matter uh, until they agree to proceed as part of, or sorry, as a result of a written disclosure of that conflict of interest from the financial planner. And the planner cannot proceed without express written consent from the client. Now, that might result in a couple of different outcomes. The clients might say, yeah, we're okay to proceed, or if they're not, that's where we might have a reason to terminate the relationship and the planner might end up dealing with just one of them or dealing with both of them in two separate engagements or dealing with uh, neither of them possibly. Uh, if you're looking for more information on that, we have a course called Addressing Conflicts of Interest that's uh, available in the Continuing Education Library 
here. And you might find that course does address this uh, nicely. Okay, and the next we see is a fairly heavy dose of bias. This is very common, and I have some questions in, especially my level one prep that are specifically designed to deal with this. And this is where we want to identify whether something is a planner's objective or a client objective. So client has uh, three objectives and limited resources. And this is an easy one here. This is easy to pick out the planner bias. Client says, yeah, we want to take a vacation every year. We also want to fund the kids' educations and we want to save for retirement. The planner runs some numbers. The client has a budget or a spending plan. And we see that only two of those are going to be valid in terms of the client's resources. They can't do more than two of these things. And which is most important? Well, as long as the client lists them like this, they all of, are of equal importance. And yet I find a lot of people who would say, ditch the vacation, uh, worry about education and retirement funding. There's no basis for that argument here. You're not provided with any information in this particular situation that says one of those three things is uh, more important than the other. And yet I find many people will say, yeah, forget about the vacation. You don't need a vacation, which I would question anyways. I think that's really uh, doubtful. If people don't have some reason to make money, they're not going to want to make money. They're not going to care about how they treat their money. Uh, you've got to have some immediate payoff for the money that you make, but whatever. And we can debate that uh, endlessly probably. I hope everybody sees though that there's an opportunity for a planner to exercise a fair bit of bias here and that's going to get picked on with an exam result. Okay, the uh, exam feedback. So a couple things here. This is uh, pulled straight from a, a candidate's responses or a candidate's outcome on the FP Canada exam. So first off, if you didn't get the bar, good for you because the bar is only sent for the CFP exam to those who failed. Uh, and what we want to look at here is just how far left of 500 are you? Now, from what I've seen so far, a really significant number of students uh, are clustered right tight in here to 500, somewhere in that 45 to 500 range. That's what's going to happen. That's just normal statistical distribution. Uh, we should find a big cluster of people right around that passing result. Okay, and then uh, down below that, we see the what I think people pay more attention to, which is the, uh, the breakdown by area. Uh, this is sort of broken down into two sub portions. So the top three portions here, collection analysis recommendation. Uh, every question on the exam is either a collection analysis or recommendation question. And then every question on the exam is either a fundamental financial planning practices or financial management or insurance or uh, retirement planning or tax or uh, investment or state. So one of those seven areas, every question is going to be one of those seven. And it's really hard to get good uh, data out of this, especially on a first attempt. And I hope you don't have uh, two failing attempts, but I know some people do, or even three, or uh, unfortunately sometimes four. And that's where we want to think about um, maybe looking at this information in a little more detail. But the first time out, one by itself just does not tell us enough. So the, that being said, uh, the sample size is better for collection analysis recommendation. The sample size is very low for the bottom seven areas. Uh, that being said, when you see a big fat bar like this, this student clearly did very well on estate planning. And beyond that, I wouldn't judge too much based on this. Now, if you saw two consistent results like this, where uh, tax and retirement are both low, that's where I would say, yeah, in fact, brush up on those areas. But only if I see this on two consecutive attempts. That's where, uh, and I'll talk about this later on, your own experience on the exam is actually a better indicator of how to put in or how to schedule or allocate your study effort. Uh, now, that being said, collection analysis recommendation. The sample size here is big enough to be helpful. If you have low collection, 
that probably means you're missing details. It probably means that you didn't pay enough attention when reading the case studies and you missed big chunks. Uh, low analysis, that's a good chance of applying some bias. That's uh, very much what I talked about on the last slide, would show up in that uh, type of low analysis result. So you wanna make sure you check your bias a little bit. And a lot of that just comes from doing practice questions and having uh, somebody else other than yourself to grade or, or uh, review those uh, practice questions. And I always recommend a student who is either going through the course with you or somebody who's passed the exam recently. And finally, one of the common problems, not the only thing that goes wrong, but one of the common problems with um, analysis is, or sorry, with the recommendations is that people are not paying enough attention to client objectives and really end up making recommendations that don't respect the client objective. Okay, I've got a few comments here on rewriting the exam. So first off, don't wait to start studying. Start studying right now. Go back to your core curriculum. Put in a half hour a day just to review concepts. So for now, this is what you should be doing. And as you're reviewing those concepts, you're gonna pick up things that you didn't do well on the exam. Even if you think you did well on a question on the exam, maybe go back and review any concepts you do remember being tested. And that's a way to check your bias. You might find there, oh goodness, I, I thought uh, whatever home buyer's plan had to be repaid in 10 years and it's actually 15 years. And even then it's not really 15 years, it's kind of 15 plus three years, depending on your time it. Uh, but anyways, that's the kind of detail you'd want to pick up on there. So right now, and I always like studying in the morning. I think it's the better time to study. Uh, pull up your Outlook calendar and block aside a half hour per day, just like going to the gym, half hour per day to review concepts. Uh, then closer to the exam, then you start adding in some practice questions. You might use hours. I'm adding a few more practice questions this time for people that previously took exam prep with us. Uh, you might go buy the GoBay package. It's reasonably priced and it's lots of questions. Just have to be careful. It's a little more uh, technical than I would like, but it's still uh, probably the best bang for your buck in terms of the number of practice questions. And then I don't like seeing students who pile on a whole bunch of exam prep. I think you should pick one exam prep based on what you think you're missing. Um, I think that what happens here, and I'll talk about this a little bit in a couple, or in the next slide, sorry, uh, is people sometimes pay too much attention, or sorry, sometimes put too much stock in. If I just go and spend a bunch of money and put in a bunch of hours without really thinking about what I'm accomplishing there, that um, leads to, I think, uh, a, a false expectation. So pick one exam prep, might be hours, uh, might be 4N. If you really wanna brush up on technical knowledge, uh, then 4N is the way to go. And I, I really like the 4N class, especially for somebody who uh, is having trouble breaking through that passing result. So you're sort of stuck at 450 or 460, uh, and you've written a couple of times, and you've done all the technique things that I talk about, might be time to go to the 4N class and really brush up. The other group of people that I think 4N is really good for is people who finished all their core stuff quite a while ago, maybe three or four years ago, and their practice or their day-to-day -day is not sort of uh, financial planning all the time. Uh, that's where the 4N class can be really good uh, because it gets you that sort of five or six days. They have an optional sixth day uh, where you're just getting the fire hose uh, sort of financial planning course all condensed together. And then uh, Gobay, if you just wanna write lots and lots of practice questions, uh, the Gobay stuff is good, it gives good feedback. Like I said, it's just a little bit too technical. So you have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. And as I mentioned before, my preference, although it's a little tricky to do this with the Gobay material, uh, but my preference here is that you get somebody else to uh, grade your results against their answer key. I think that that's the best way to identify and reduce bias. Okay, uh, the next is around uh, failure on the exam. So I see this uh, show up or hear this show up in a bunch of different ways, but essentially this happens where students don't accept the fact that failure is a possibility. And I say this all the time, 
but I see intelligent and well-prepared people write this exam and fail it. That's not exclusive to this one where you saw 56% of exam writers fail. This is the case even where we see better passing outcomes that sometimes you just get somebody who by all uh, accounts should pass the exam. They studied well, they prepared well, they do financial planning day in and day out, and they just didn't pass. And you have to give yourself that latitude. You have to say, yeah, failure here is something that can happen. Otherwise, what are you saying? Are you saying that you're uh, so much uh, better than your peers that you can't see yourself failing? Are you saying anybody who fails the exam is somehow, I don't know, dumb or you're judging them somehow? These are not fair things to do. It's not fair pressure to put on yourself to create that very high standard where you simply are not permitting uh, contemplation of failure. So instead of saying I can't afford to fail or I refuse to fail or something like that, you want to think about something like I have done everything that I can reasonably do to prepare for this exam. I think that that's the better approach. I think that's better uh, psychologically. I think it's better in terms of how you'll actually prepare for the exam. And my next concern here, and I mentioned this briefly on the last slide, is if you do every possible kind of study, so you pay a tutor, you do whatever, there's four or five different exam prep classes available out there, uh, you attend a bunch of those. Uh, so now, instead of sort of regular discipline study and good exam technique, which I think you can learn from any of the exam prep uh, material, uh, it's certainly a focus of ours, and I know some others uh, have a similar focus. Uh, so now, are you just preparing for, sorry, are you preparing for the exam, or are you just sort of throwing time and money at it and saying, well, if I throw enough time and money at it, then I've guaranteed a pass, and I don't think that's a healthy approach. So I have to say, I know what I'm trying to accomplish with my studies, and I'm going to focus on what I need to address not to say I'm gonna do every single thing. All right, did you take any notes on exam day? This is something I highly recommend is, regardless of how you feel about the exam, if you come out of it and feel like you passed or feel like it might be another exam attempt for you or whatever, uh, take five minutes, just five minutes, not a big set of notes here, and you write down what your experience was. So you get out to your car, or whatever after the exam, pull out a notepad, make a few notes for yourself. What went well, what went poorly? And it's just for you. This is for you to guide your studies on the off chance that you have to write again. I uh, talk about your exam day experience here, and this is something I want you to think about now. Uh, even if you didn't take this good set of notes, it's only been a couple months since the exam, and make some notes for yourself about what happened on exam day. Was there enough time? Did you run out of time? Was, this, was there a specific kind of question that bothered you? Uh, was there, did you do well on multiple choice or did you do well on case study or whatever? Think about those things and really try to limit to the things you can control. Uh, if you had a bad experience in the exam room, I know some people talked about losing some time to a server outage in Alberta, for example. Can't control that, but really focus on what you can control here. And be honest with yourself. Uh, what might have gone wrong? In the end, uh, we do know that 44% of people passed. It's not to say that uh, everybody should have passed or some uh, ridiculous comment like that, but we do know it was possible to pass the exam. And what could you have done differently that might have created a better outcome? And sometimes it's just bad luck. I talk about that in exam prep quite a bit might be that you just didn't study the right stuff or you had some negative experience on exam day or whatever it is. And that's stuff that, you know, to some extent, bad luck, you can't fully control it. Oh, sorry, there we go. And finally, uh, exam technique. So what's gonna happen on exam day here? And I want you to think about this. I'm not a huge fan of students taking big chunks of time off leading right up to the exam. I think you're way better off to start putting in that half hour or thereabouts a day right now as compared to taking two or three weeks off. I hear all kinds of plans around this. I'm honestly just not a fan of this. I'm giving you this notice plenty far in advance to schedule your life accordingly. Uh, I find that that sort of cramming approach is not great. 
increases stress. You're never going to get enough done to feel like that time was worth it. Maybe you want to take a day or two off, and that's more about stress management than about studying. Uh, you really should know almost everything to know right now uh, and really just spend the next few months brushing up for the exam. And finally, have a strategy. Have a strategy for how you're going to study. Write that out based on maybe some of the comments in this video or what you've heard from others. Think about how you're going to uh, study for the exam. On exam day, you want to think about writing down a strategy as to how you're going to deal with time management, time value of money questions, case study versus multiple choice, how you're going to allocate time for those, what do the grades mean in terms of how you're going to allocate time and effort here. Maybe you think about a maximum time allotment per grade or per question or per case, whatever it is. Write those things down. Okay. Well, for those who were unsuccessful in the exam, I, uh, I'm sorry for the result. I, I'd love to see everybody pass the exam. It, uh, it, it warms my heart when I see students pass, and it breaks my heart when I stu see students fail. I live and die by every exam result that comes in. Uh, for those that pass, congratulations, although if you stuck through the whole video, I'd be surprised. And for those getting ready to write, don't be disheartened by the low pass rate. I think there are some reasons to account for that. I think that there are some things we can do to increase the chance of success and yeah, just uh, keep at it. Put your study in and have a, a conscious effort in how you study and prepare for and then write the exam. Thanks very much for your attention and enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much.